Okay, we are all set up. Let's move on. All right, we can start now. Welcome to What the Heck is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Friends of Latin America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube Live. Today's episode, Nicaragua Expels the Organization of American States. How will this impact Nicaragua and the integration of the Americas via institutions such as CELAC, La Comunidad de Estados Latinoamericanos y Caribeños? On Sunday, April 24, 2022, Nicaragua said it had closed the local office of the Organization of American States, the OAS, a US-based group that claims to promote solidarity and cooperation among countries in the Americas and revoke the credentials of several of its staff. The official government statement reads in part, quote, the people and government of Nicaragua have denounced and continue to denounce the shameful condition of one of the political instruments of intervention and domination of the State Department of the government of the United States, wrongly and falsely called the Organization of American States. The people and government of Nicaragua do not and will not recognize this instrument of colonial administration, which does not represent at any time the sovereign union of our Latin and Caribbean America. And that on the contrary is an instrument of Yankee imperialism to violate rights and independences, sponsoring and promoting interventions and invasions, legitimizing coups in different formats and modalities with the aim which they have not accomplished of, dis of disintegrating through humiliation, submission and surrender of our national sovereignties. So that was a really very strong for our audience, was a really strong, significant event that happened on Sunday the 24th. And I'm really honored and it's a great privilege uh, to introduce to all of you, uh, Nicaraguan Foreign Minister Dennis Mokala. He has graciously given his time to us today to talk about uh, this significant foreign policy event made by Nicaragua on Sunday. And it's a great honor, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, to, to introduce you to our audience and invite you to today's conversation. So, Hello, Terry. It's truly a pleasure to be here with you and to greet your audience. And I want to thank you for this kind invitation to take part in this interview, in this conversation, in such an important uh, mean of communication. Well, thank you. I think, um, you know, for me, it's a great honor and privilege to, to be speaking with you today. And for our audience, um, Foreign Minister Moncada is joining us live from, from Managua. And let's, let's start with um, what, well, maybe we should go back a little further because in, in November, uh, Nicaragua announced that it would be uh, leaving the OAS. That was November 19, I believe. Uh, traditionally, or my understanding is technically it's a two year process to leave. Uh, and so let's talk about, maybe start with what happened in November and why Nicaragua made this decision. And I should also just remind the audience that this was November 19th, was, which was two weeks after the reelection of President Ortega and Vice President uh, Rosario Murillo. What led to the November 19th decision and what uh, accelerated things to happen on Sunday the 24th? El, el 19 de noviembre, on nos... November 19, we uh, communicated officially to the Secretary General of the OAS that we were going to denounce the OAS charter and that is a sovereign decision of the Nicaraguan government. That is to say, our government 
led by Commander Daniel Ortega and Vice President Rosario Murillo, made the important decision of denouncing the OAS charter and formally starting on November 19 uh, last year, a process that is contemplated in the same charter in which established the possibility that all member states of the organization have the possibility to denouncing this charter. And within a period of two years, the country uh, formally breaks the relationship with the organization. It is clear, Terry, that Nicaragua is a democratic and open country that promotes healthy uh, international relations based on friendship, fraternity. But essentially, we emphasize the importance of uh, having healthy international relations in accordance with the principles of international law with the UN Charter, with the living with the principle of living coexistence. And in our government, we analyze the relations and the necessity of governing these international relations, respecting the fundamental principles of international law, respect of the sovereign equality of the peoples, the non-interference in domestic affairs of states, respect towards self-determination, the respect towards the internal policy of the state, the non-aggression, the non-menace with the use of force, the non-implementation of arbitrary unilateral measures that turn out to be illegal and inhuman. So the relations among countries are governed by the Vienna Convention and international law, the UN Charter, the OAS Charter, among, among other legal instruments. And Nicaragua and our government undoubtedly demands reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we are very respectful of independence, sovereignty, and self-determination of the states and the respect towards the peoples and the nations of the international community. Therefore, we demand precisely the respect of all these principles set forth in international law, the UN Charter, the always AS Charter, that is the topic that we are addressing today. Mm -hmm. So Terry, in that note that we submitted on November 19, precisely we explain why did we decide to denounce the OAS Charter. And it's because the OAS ended up becoming an instrument of interference used by the US to project their mandate and the execution of the Monroe Doctrine of 1823 that basically aimed at expanding the power of the OAS over the region. And and precisely to stop the interference uh, uh, by Europe in the region. That was a stage in which the US was replacing the old colonizers and the old empires, and they wanted to establish a control over the region, enriching their empire in detriment of the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. So basically, in that note that we submitted on November 19, uh, these arguments, Terry. So, boy, I have a, a whole lot that I want, <laughs> I want to comment on and get additional comments from you on. So I think in general terms, as I listen to you speak, and I think for much of our audience that uh, is very involved in Latin America and Caribbean, uh, policy and, and solidarity that in our policy work is, is specifically against US intervention in all its forms, economic and military and, and policy wise. 
that you, we can basically look at European interventionism, European imperialism being replaced by US imperialism and US interventionism. I do believe, and I'm not sure, uh, Senor Moncada, what uh, part of the OAS charter is specifically in, but there is language in the OAS charter that prohibits intervention in domestic policy of all member states. Is that correct? I mean, intervention in all forms in the, in the domestic uh, policy. So that sort of feeling is prohibited by the OAS and yet doesn't seem to be recognized by all of its members. Am, am I correct in, in that? In, in that understanding of the charter? Yes, Terry. There is an apparent uh, contradiction between what is written there in the OAS charter and what occurs in reality and what the organization does in their daily activities since 1948 yeah. on the date of its foundation uh, with the participation of 21 countries from Latin America and the Caribbean when they subscribed this uh, charter and precisely the design of the this organization and the creation of this organization was pre-established by the United States mm -hmm. with the purpose of accomplishing the U.S. mission of uh, making their Monroe Doctrine a reality. And the performance of the OAS and what they do, their behavior, the way the OAS ambassadors act in the different countries follow that mandate and those orientations um, defined by the US elite. So the, the, OAS, the OAS receives instructions by the US elite. So now that we make reference to the OAS charter, let me say this. It is established in the charter that none of the provisions authorizes the organization to interfere in the domestic affairs of the member states. So it's very clear what is written there. It's a principle that is there and is also in the UN charter yeah. and the OAS charter includes that principle because it's a regional uh, organization and is it in its foundational charter but in practice this is a principle that is constantly broken systematically broken permanently broken so this non-interference which is the ideal scenario would render would render easier that the countries could develop their policies as they pleased in an independent manner, free from coercion in a sovereign way, without having to be worried by interference and the maneuvers, the political uh, behavior and the sanctions and unfair unilateral measures exercised by the US against many countries, not only in Latin America and the Caribbean, but also in Europe and Asia. So we can see here how a first principle is broken by the actions of the OAS based on the demands of the US elite in that organization. That is why we say, and our government has clearly stated that we have expelled the OAS because we are not a colony of any superpower. 
Nicaragua is not a colony of anyone, and we have reiterated this several times. The government of President Ortega has said this several times. So if we are not a colony of anyone, why are we going to be there in an organization that is basically a ministry of colonies, that has acted as a ministry of colonies? And the same charter of the OA, of the OAS establishes that peace and security needs to be guaranteed throughout the continent. But what happens in reality? The opposite, the opposite. All the actions and the measures taken in the OAS that are related to interference, that are related to interference in domestic affairs of other countries. So they want to oblige us to act in a particular way. So the OAS has been hijacked by the Washington elite since the beginning. So countries that have become the subdued to this elite are following that mandate. Those countries that uh, have assumed this behavior of colonized countries, different from our case. So this principle is not complied with of guaranteeing security and peace throughout the region because all these unilateral uh, coercive measures against us, uh, this pretension of imposing democracy or a certain type of democracy in our countries when we have, for example, a direct popular democracy, a participatory democracy that includes all the, all the sectors. We are not an elite democracy of just a group of power. We are a true democracy of the peoples. That is why we have decided that in our country, the people holds the power. So we have seen how the OAS charter is systematically disrespected by the organization itself. So, for example, the organization should uh, develop solidarity actions in cases of aggression. Let's remember mm -hmm. the case of the aggression of the UK against Argentina with the case of mm -hmm. the Malvinas Island. But, and what happened with this regulation? What happened mm -hmm. with the uh, Inter-American Treaty for uh, reciprocal assistance, the TIAR, that needed to guarantee solidarity among the countries of Latin America. Precisely, the UK committed this aggression against Argentina in order to uh, keep their domination on the Malvinas Island and to break with the sovereignty of uh, Argentina, that is the true owner of the Malvinas Island. Yeah, and that, and that uh conflict is still happening <laughs> still... so oh gosh let me i keep hearing more and more i want to talk about this afternoon so so listening to you describe how and why um what happened on november 19th i think it's really very clear to me and i want to reiterate this with our audience that this was to leave the OAS is a matter of preserving national sovereignty for Nicaragua, domestic sovereignty, national resource sovereignty, sovereignty of the people, and, uh, and, a, and a democratically elected government. It's, um, and I think it's really clear for any of us who have studied in depth what happened in Bolivia in October of 2019, we know very clearly what the OAS is capable of doing and what it's done in Honduras in supporting US uh, appointed presidents in the past and, and what was attempted in your country in, in spring of 2018. And I, I agree with you, I think it is you know an instrument. It's, it's an instrument created during the first or right on the heels of the first Cold War you know, to basically preserve uh, U.S. influence on the on the Americas and and the Monroe Doctrine, as as you said, there was. Um, I, I I I'm talking to all of you today from Mexico City, and in, in September, uh, President Lopez Obrador had reconvened Salak after a four year pause. It was a Salak summit 
here in Mexico City, September 18, I want to say, and uh, Minister Moncada was here. And it was fascinating to me, many of the things that were said, uh, and it can be for all of you um, listening, it can you can listen to the entire uh, Cumbre de Salac on YouTube. It's a five hour, it was a five hour uh, meeting. And it's quite fascinating to listen as everyone's sitting around the same table in this room talking about um, the Americas and what each country would like to see. Salak is 35 members, I believe, uh, minus the United States and Canada who were never invited to participate. Salak is for Latin America and the Caribbean. But there was one thing specifically mentioned, and, and I say this with some trepidation because I know the El Salvador government is controversial, but uh, Vice President Ulloa attended the Salak Summit in September on behalf of El Salvador, and he very succinctly described the OAS, and he mentioned it as an instrument of the first Cold War, created in 1947, I believe, and how in 1962, Cuba was expelled simply because they had a different political paradigm. And, and he went on to mention without name, uh, the secretary general's involvement in, in uh, election, electoral results, what we would call elect, uh, election uh, coup, soft coups, be electoral means, be a legislative means, very ju uh, and judicial means. He was very, very clear. He was very succinct and he was very clear. And uh, in, in what he had to say in describing the OAS. And he also said, you know, look, Salak exists, it's efficient, it currently exists, and that perhaps we should use that to uh, build a block and interface with the rest of the world. And I thought that was very uh, profound. And so as I'm listening to you describe all of this today, I wonder if you can comment on. Um, how leaving the OAS, because now you are joining Cuba and Venezuela, Cuba that was expelled, chose not to come back, and Venezuela who chose when uh, Delcy Rodriguez was foreign minister to leave. How do the three of you as allies and now working together outside of the OAS, how, how do you see this transforming the Americas? And in particular, uh, its influence, the three of you and your influence or potential influence going forward um, with Salak? Terry, countries in Latin America and the Caribbean are moving forward. Mm -hmm. We are moving forward. Yeah. And uh, we have been working based on our interest and our projects and our policies and work uh, for that precisely related to the example of uh, Simon Bolivar and his fight mm -hmm. for independence, Martí, Sandino and other historical mm -hmm. figures. How our countries are moving forward to attain a real independence status for the benefit of our populations. How can we uh, break with these old slavery chains of these uh, colonialism chains that have prevented us from developing ourselves as countries, as nations, and to progress to develop our states, and at the same time, implementing the policies that each people with their own philosophy culture defines and decides using their freedom and using their cosmovision for this progress. That is to say the struggle, and that is why it's so important this analysis of the OAS and pay attention to the CELAC role because we as countries have found throughout the years and based on the experience we have lived and seeing what has uh, unfolded in the OAS that the U.S. as an empire and the U.S. elite and, I, and it's important to clarify this. Let's not confuse the U.S. citizenry with the elite. 
the intellectuals, the workers, are not the same as the elite that controls the U.S. Mm -hmm. empire. It's important to understand this because this power elite in the U.S. has been the one controlling power and they have acted in detriment of the peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And that is why when the Cuban revolution took place and with all progress and the vision of positive future for the Cuban population and the example that, he, that was set for the other countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, we started to see changes, reflections political struggles, economic struggles, ideological struggles, mm -hmm. structural struggles as well. And we are moving forward. And you start to see the, you started to see phenomena such as the revolutionary Sandinist movement in 1979 mm -hmm. in Nicaragua and later on Venezuela, precisely resume this, uh, uh, line of thought of Bolivar, as it happened in Nicaragua, we rescued the ideas of Sandino that precisely were lost during the first and second decade of the last century. And Sandino, after so many years of fight, was able to expel the U.S. Marines from Nicaraguan soil, as Bolivar did during his times he expelled the Spanish Empire, as you may all remember. And Bolivia, that I was mentioning it before, Bolivia was able to progress and started to see successes. But we have seen in the last decade, Terry, how these uh, nefarious presence of the US empire in the Latin American region has created instability. They have promoted aggression, coup d'etat. And when we take a look of what has happened in Haiti, in Venezuela, in Honduras, Paraguay, Brazil, precisely, when uh, lawfare has been used against, uh, for example, Dilma, Lula, as it has occurred in many of our countries. Precisely this. Part of the diplomatic and ideological fight to defend our interests and to continue moving forward and looking for benefits for our population, we have waged this struggle in the OAS as well. However, there you see a reiteration and a repetition of the use of that space as a ministry of colonies, as an instrument of interference and aggression against our countries of Latin America. And they persist and they continue trying to keep that position. And Nicaragua suffered from this in the last years. The U.S. attempts to impose a, a government in Nicaragua, and they try to organize a, a regime change through uh, groups that uh, are involved with terrorism, and they want to break with the constitutional order as they attempted back in 2018 in Nicaragua. And we saw what occurred in Bolivia. The OAS terribly with their uh, groups of electoral observers created the conditions in Bolivia for a coup d'etat in Bolivia, an electoral coup d'etat as we all saw. And the same they have attempted in Nicaragua and also in Venezuela. So that is why what should our countries do if we are part of an organization such as the OAS that has a foundational charter that establishes clear, clear principles on how the countries should behave uh, within the context of uh, cooperation 
but the organization itself acts uh, in an opposite manner, opposed to the principles. They act as an instrument for instability, of uh, pressure, of interference, of an extension of the mandate of the U.S. elites. And so what they do is uh, develop efforts to topple democratically elected governments, such as the uh, government of uh, Commander Daniel Ortega and Vice President Murillo, as the government of uh, President Maduro in Venezuela, and uh, as uh, what occurred with the government of former President Evo Morales. So this needs to trigger our reflection. And we need to understand that this organization does not comply with the fundamental principles of international law and of the, the principles it's themselves of the charter because we see that even though you carry out efforts of democracy of uh, diplomacy but uh, this interference ends up having a cost in our country because lives are lost due to this interference, police and other officials have died and they continue insisting and saying that Nicaragua is violating human rights. And we have reiterated, no, we have said that we protect human rights. That is why our policy, the policy of Nicaragua based on reconciliation promoted by President Ortega is oriented towards common well-being. We say we give preference to the poor without excluding any other sector. Mm -hmm. We are including all the sectors. But these vast majorities that have been systematically for years, they need to be given back the rights that were stripped from them a long time ago. But the US government doesn't like that and they don't see any positive aspect of our government because our our policy is oriented to the needs of our citizens and the citizens uh, have uh, assumed these policies as theirs we have uh, oriented our actions towards economic development and to guarantee food sovereignty mm -hmm. our uh constructions of roads policy our intention of guaranteeing the energy supply we have 99 percent of our population receiving a energy supply and we are moving forward and we are trying to make sure that this uh energy matrix is based on a clean energy mm -hmm. environmentally friendly but this is not highlighted by the US. And in the OAS, the, the countries that are subordinated to the US act collectively against us, approving resolutions, trying to de delegitimize popular governments that are not uh, following the instructions of Washington, such as Nicaragua's government. We that disagree with the aggression against other states. We that disagree with the policies of destruction uh, implemented against certain countries. And we clearly disagree with the illegal appropriation of natural resources of our countries. And in this regard, Nicaragua is very clear. We are very clear in our domestic policy and in our foreign policy. We we are very clear. We abide by international law and the fundamental principles of international law and the UN and OAS charter. So when we uh, reached this reflection in this analysis, we said, wait a minute, this uh, body is following simply the mandates of the empire in detriment of our peoples. At that moment, we said, we cannot continue being part of this organization. And that is why last year we started denouncing the OAS charter. And last Sunday we said, 
well, we're going to expel the organization from our country. We're going to close their offices. We're going to withdraw the credentials of our ambassadors that are there in the OAS. We're not going to participate anymore in any body related to the OAS, nor in the General Assembly, nor in the Permanent Council, nor in the meeting of uh, ministers of foreign affairs, nor in the summit of the Americas. That is not a summit of the Americas, as long as not all of the countries of the continent are present there. So that OAS truly does not comply with its role and brings no benefit to any of the states of Latin America and the Caribbean. And therefore, Terry, it is justified this decision and why mm -hmm. have we denounced this charter? Why are we withdrawing from the organization? And why are we formally uh, not participating anymore there? And simultaneously, the CELAC has been boosted and reinforced. Mm -hmm. And that is why CELAC exists. And about CELAC, if, if you want to interrupt me, you don't, you can do it, no problem. Oh, well, okay, I, I have like so much I want to ask you. I don't know how much more time you have, but I'm, I'm really, you're just giving me so many, so much wonderful information that there's a couple things I'd like to follow up on and then let's go, let's go back to CELAC because I think, you know, the, the, uh, the meet the summit that happened in September was really crucial. The timing of it was so crucial for the Americas, for Latin America and the Caribbean. But just for me to be clear and for our audience to be clear, what happened on Sunday the 24th was an expulsion of OAS staff, OAS presence in Nicaragua, but still you the there is this two-year exit process that needs to occur that is being recognized by Nicaragua. In other words, you announced on 19 November you would be leaving, which means the full exit will be on uh, 19 November, what, 2023. Is that, am I correct in that? There just will no longer be OAS presence in your country. Yes, correct, okay. correct, Terry. That's the way the charter establishes it. Okay. Yes. In okay. the event of the denunciation of the treaty, two years need to pass for the countries and the organizations to be completely uh, non-bound anymore, and so that the effect of the charters may cease, may stop for the country. Okay, thank you so much for that. Then the other thing uh, I would like to add, and this is really more uh, for our audience to understand something that you said, uh, Foreign Minister, about governments that the, the Nicaraguan government, the Sandinista government, the government of Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo have, are interested in and are not just interested, are building a domestic economy for all citizens with an emphasis on the poor, but not ignoring the middle class or upper class. And so one of the things that I saw in November, and I, I would say your comments are actually regional in what you said. In, in November, I had the privilege of um, of traveling Latin America and observing um, your elections on November 7th, uh, then traveling to Venezuela uh, for the 21 November elections. Those were regional and local elections in Nicaragua, what those in the States would call uh, mayoral elections and gubernatorial elections. And then at the end of November, November 28th, were the presidential elections in Honduras. And then in December, uh, Chile, but in the case of November, at the after election day and looking at, at the results in all three countries, November, uh, excuse me, Nicaragua, 
Venezuela and Honduras, it was really, really clear that a theme across the Americas, and then let's also not forget on November 30th, Barbados left uh, the British crown, um, was really, really clear that across the Americas, people were voting for national sovereignty, for natural resource sovereignty, and voting for governments with an economic plan beneficial to all of its citizens. And I say an economic plan because we've seen everything from one step to the left to revolutionary left economic plans. But, but in general, people voting for governments with an economic plan, such as that in Nicaragua, that was focused on uplifting all citizens, not just benefiting the wealthy elite as we, we see predominantly in the United States. And I think to me, that's a really evident theme that happened last year. Throughout the year, there were elections across the Americas all, you know, all year, 2021. Is that, am I correct in, in observing that? Do you think that that's a reasonable conclusion to make? It's a combination between the love for the homeland of our countries, love to your land, to your uh, population, to your environment, to your nature, to your resources, to peace, to peace, to stability, and to the creation and the development of the conditions for the improvement of the economies, especially after the pandemic of the COVID-19, after hurricanes and other natural phenomena, after so many scourges we have uh, faced, scourges in terms of security, of health, or natural adverse phenomena. So basically, population and uh, our nationals they have a sense of dignity mm -hmm. and they uh, love their land, their country, their patriots, they want sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So this has to do with the existence of human beings as free beings, as independent and sovereign beings that love self-determination after centuries of being slaves uh, and suffering exploitation, the sense of freedom, of uh, defense of your homeland, of your fellow citizens, of your dignity, is so important, it's fundamental. And this has to do with the political ideological nature this sense of homeland is combined with the economic aspect mm -hmm. to be able to strengthen stability and the economics and social peace and the non-aggression and the and to block the effect of the unilateral measures we need to strengthen our economy and to guarantee food security mm -hmm. and food security taking into account the material food, but also the spiritual food. Yeah. So that is why in Nicaragua, yeah. we have programs and policies that are very important and involve culture, gender equality, participation of women, to give a specific special role to young people, to young women, to young men to have a freedom of cult, of religion. All these elements, once our population works based on these uh, values uh, with the support of the government, with honesty, using resources provided by the state and by the society for their own benefit always bearing in mind honesty and transparency as fundamental pillars. So we have to deal with propaganda and falsehood and fake news and the attempts to twist 
the truth and trying to delegitimize this reality. In Nicaragua, and you have had the chance to come here and you probably have seen these things with your own eyes. We had alliances that were very important, alliances between the state, government, the workers, and the private sector, the companies, the private companies. Yeah. So here in Nicaragua, the private sector in their highest levels have participated for a long time in productive conditions. And this has uh, allowed us to create jobs to uh, speak with uh, representatives of the workers and the companies uh, finding the to reach the highest level of social justice for uh, decent salaries, uh, looking forward to obtaining uh, social stability, avoiding political and social conflicts. However, unfortunately, that alliance that uh, was effective for several years and that brought results to Nicaragua is uh, broken by the interference of the government of the US that perceives these policies as inconvenient to their uh, ideas of exploitation, domination, and control. And that is why here in Nicaragua, up uh, to the 18, when we saw a terrorist uh, coup d'etat attempt that resulted in destruction of infrastructure, we have had great experiences. So that is why I emphasize that we have a focus not only in the poor sector, but we try to include every economic sector in our country, even those that hold great amounts of power. So you, you made a comment uh, about national sovereignty being part of and, and natural resource sovereignty um, equating to security and stability for Nicaraguans, um, economic development for the people that equates to employment, jobs, income. These are all really positive things. And in my opinion, are reasons why Nicaraguans remain in Nicaragua and choose, have no reason to and choose not to migrate, which seems to me would be something highly promoted and highly desirable by the United States. And ironically is not recognized by the United, United States. And we have huge issues of insecurity, violence, unemployment uh, in Central America, in uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras specific, specifically, maybe less Honduras now, uh, hopefully with uh, their new government of Xiomara Castro. But can we talk just a minute about why there is no or very little migration from Nicaragua? I think people that mi migrate, my observation is people that migrate from Nicaragua, it is personal choice, um, education and coming back, things like that. It is not uh, migration out of dire need for work, for physical security. We, we, we simply don't see that. We do not see Nicaraguan people leaving their country the way we do in other parts of Central America. That's an interesting topic, Terry. It's very interesting because if you pay attention, if a country has stability, good security levels and a good health system and a good educational system and the government and the state uh, creates uh, jobs and develop uh, programs to make the country progress, taking into account the needs of population. When these phenomena take place, not only the US, but also some European countries try to uh, promote and create 
conditions of instability in our countries in terms of economy, in terms of politics, and they use every mechanism they can. And since they have so many resources and especially so many technical and financial resources to do that, the, their knowledge, so they design their policies to uh, promote psychological and emotional instability in our countries. So they promote through some uh, subversive activities, hidden uh, techniques, they try to create among certain sectors of population, they try to promote these uh, flows of migration from our countries abroad, because they use it to say, oh, migration is increasing in this or that country, because they are experiencing this or that problem, even if this is not occurring in reality. They make up stories. In the case of Nicaragua, we have a combination between a good government that aims at uh, developing the best conditions for its population and a population that is well aware of the political, economic problems taking place throughout the world and, and the suffering they have faced in the past linked to the foreign interference. And so Nicaraguan people is very uh, mature. Our Nicaraguans are mature, politically speaking. And, but still, we see campaigns aiming at promoting Nicaraguan migration to other countries. But as you said, in Nicaragua, migration is minimum. However, you see how so some media outlets say in Mexico, 2000 uh, Central American uh, immigrants have been uh, detained. And, and then they say there are two, three or four Nicaraguan citizens uh, that are part of this group. So some media outlets try to use uh, Nicaraguans to say that there is a migration from Nicaragua to other countries to introduce this idea in public opinion and yeah. mentioning Nicaraguans as part of this uh, phenomenon. Migration has structural causes, security, uh, politics in other country. We have high levels of security in Nicaragua we have positive policies develop our government we uh, have uh, educational programs in the countryside and our universities are working shoulder to shoulder with our peasants living in our rural areas and they have access to education to university and technical education which is truly a very important thing to mention. So Nicaraguans love their land, love their homeland. They do. I can share with our audience very clearly and with you, uh, Senor Mancada, that that's very, very true. That, um, and it's a, one, it's a really beautiful thing to be among, that when among your people, that feeling of pride and, and happiness is general day-to-day life and I and I you know that is because of the security and the quality of life that you and your government have created I, I wonder if you have time for one more question <laughs> yes. yeah it's um you mentioned um earlier when we started our conversation that you know Latin America and the Caribbean as a region is moving forward and I think that's very true and I and not just in recent years I think you could make an argument in the last probably 20. 20 years for sure. Moving forward as a block, as a as sovereign nations, uh, and one of the reasons you're choosing to leave the OAS is to be able to operate as a sovereign nation equal in the international world to the United States and other powers. Um, and, I, and I applaud you for that. Um, so you mentioned moving forward, the region moving forward, and, and, and this is really coming back to Salak, I guess. How uh, 
how much of this moving forward, I, and I would maybe say multi, creating a multilateral paradigm or expanding it. I think the multilateral paradigm already exists. So expanding that, how much of that uh, has to do with trade and foreign relations with, with China? And I would also probably throw in Russia and Iran too, but perhaps principally China. The foreign policy of our government, as we said at the beginning of this conversation, is a policy that is broad, open, that precisely aims at strengthening friendship, relationships, fraternal relationships based on exchange, based on investment, and the strengthening of a cooperation relationship in international organizations and the participation in the in positions of power in international organizations. President Ortega keeps an epistolar communication and keeps a constant email communication with different heads of state throughout the world, congratulating them for their day of independence, for any other important uh, day, expressing condolences in the event of tragedies. So there is a foreign policy based on dynamism and very human. And we have broaden our foreign policy. I want to tell you, Terry, that through the UN, with the presence of our permanent mission there and our ambassador, we have been able to broaden the agreements of diplomatic relations with many countries. And precisely, we do that through uh, concurrence, because for Nicaragua is very complex and difficult to have an embassy, a physical embassy in each one of the countries. But we try to do it through the concurrence. So we have an embassy in a country, and, but we reach other countries as well to keep uh, a direct communication, mutual support, solidarity, and precisely contributing to strengthen international peace and security. The exchanges in uh, terms of mutual interest and with Iran, we have a great relationship. We have had very significant exchanges, visits uh, of Iranian uh, officials in our country but also uh, visits of Nicaraguan officers in Tehran. So analyzing the cooperation, the investments taking place in both countries, in agriculture, in uh, agricultural techniques, in the medical field, and in areas related to medicine, also with uh, medicines, education. So we have plenty of uh, exchanges. We uh, organize mutual uh, conferences between the University of Managua and the University of Tehran. So we have uh, strengthened this communication and exchange relationship, our cooperation as a whole and technical support in uh, the medical field and in agriculture. And with China, with People's Republic of China, we have been working uh, for more than four months, uh, resuming the international historical uh, relationships that the Sandinista revolution had started back in the 80s, at the beginning of the 80s, and that ended up interrupted 
with the political changes that took place in Nicaragua of neoliberal governments that interrupted that uh, relationship. So Nicaragua has res resumed an old friendship relationship based on brotherhood and fraternity and uh, programs that are precisely oriented towards the resolution of the poverty problems of our populations. And as you know, China has progressed remarkably to leave behind poverty. So we have a great relationship with China that uh, has uh, improved with time. This uh, is a bilateral relationship with great uh, solidarity, mutual solidarity in the different fields and areas. So, and um, can you uh, can you comment on on uh, Nicaragua's relationship with Russia right now? I mean, it's you know for the whole world, this is uh, a pretty uh, precarious moment, um, and my country most certainly is not innocent in uh, in the current situation. But how uh, um, how does Nicaragua see uh, the current situation in, in Europe, specifically Ukraine? Am I allowed to ask that? <laughs> you know, I understand that. I understand that. <laughs> What happens is that you made a question um, naming and, uh, uh, num some countries in order, but I'm going to change the order of this question because truly the problem of this invasion has to do with the US, the NATO, the European Union controlled by the United States, Ukraine, turning Ukraine in a sort of uh, platform of uh, weapons and feeding uh, an attitude of aggression against Russia. Mm -hmm. So the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, has repeated several times before this a military operation uh, erupted and it called my attention the emphasis and the insistence of President Vladimir Putin and uh, Minister Lavrov warning the US and the NATO saying them don't continue moving towards the east don't continue sieging us and getting close to our borders Security is an essential and comprehensive principle. Let's talk about security for all. If you continue moving towards Russia, I want to be clear about this. If you continue with this, we will no, we will no go backwards. He was very clear and insisted in sitting to have a conversation and to have a dialogue and to uh, resume old agreements, old security agreements that have been subscribed by all the parties in Europe, in, in the region between Europe and Asia. And it's clear, Terry, that if the NATO and in the US and the US using the NATO and in the, and the European Union, Ukraine, they continue in this path, Russia has the right to defend itself. Russia has the right to defend itself and to defend themselves actively. And it's, this needs to be taken into account by the US, the NATO, especially because in the end, Ukraine is being used as a platform, as I said before, as a platform for aggression, a very dangerous platform for aggression. This is, this is a topic that involves the 
main superpowers, but it's in, in, important for everyone in the world. Because even if our countries are far away from this uh, place of conflict, we have the right to live in peace. And we have the right to have peaceful relationships with countries that live in conditions of peace. Therefore, we can also say, let's live in peace. The US, the NATO, please stop threatening other countries, stop, stop threatening and sieging Russia because you are endangering the security of your own populations and the security of other surrounding countries. Let's quickly remember that uh, recently there was a, an attempt of coup d'etat in Kazakhstan, in Belarus. And Kazakhstan has a borders with China. So we are seeing a very critical scenario with a, a high degree of aggression and all the countries have the right to say those who are threatening Russia, stop. We all have the right to live in peace and Russia has the right to live in peace as well as the Europeans has the, have the right to live in peace and the countries of Africa, Asia and the Americas. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. You've been incredibly generous this afternoon. Is there anything um, that you would like to add to our conversation or before I let you go? Is there... I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank you for this interview, for the interest you have in Nicaragua, for the interest in uh, sharing the truth of what goes on in Nicaragua, because we have we are suffering the consequences of fake news. And I want to tell you that not all the media outlets, we are aware that are some powerful media outlets that lie and some others like you that tell the truth. So thank you. I wanted to thank you and to say that in Nicaragua, we are moving towards a positive path. We are part of other international organizations such as CELAC that has a bright future that is uh, resuming this uh, historical role of integration and this aspiration of sovereignty and freedom. And we, we are trying to contribute from our place for peace and security at a domestic level, at an international level, at a uh, universal level. We all want peace. We all want a new international order in which we can truly see um, multilateralism strengthen and the strengthening of democracy within international organizations. And we would like to see a true multipolarity and it is actually taking place in this historical, political and geopolitical moment in the world. So a new international order for the well-being of all the countries in the world to live in peace, in a peaceful coexistence, in development and in progress. A better world is possible and we can do it. Oh my gosh, it's just so beautiful and so hopeful. And I'm so thankful for those hopeful words in this particular moment in, in our, in our uh, global history as human beings. Um, I'm so thankful for your time today. You've been incredibly generous um, to speak with us and it's been a real honor and a privilege to have this conversation with you. Um, I wanna remind 
our audience that you've been watching What the F is going on in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. We broadcast every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube Live. Um, also be sure to catch Code Pink Radio every Thursday morning, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern, 7, what would that be, 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific, and that program broadcasts on WBAI out of New York City and WPFW out of Washington, D.C. Both projects can be found on Apple Podcasts, and uh, be sure to watch us next, next week. And thank you again, Senor Moncada, just a real honor and a real privilege, and I, I am so thankful for today's conversation. It was just absolutely wonderful. Saludos a todos. Thank you. A greeting to all of you. <laughs>